<clears throat> Alright, so my to I, I'm Nick O'Day, and my topic is ultra-low power encryption. Now, I'm pretty sure we know what encryption is, but in case you were playing with a cootie catcher or maybe shuffling some cards, uh, I'll go over it for you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> encryption is basically a way of masking information and making it unreadable to unauthorized parties and readable only to the authorized parties. So, uh, in this internet age, we use encryption practically constantly from logging in to sending our private information over the web. And then with wireless, we're also sending out this information which can be easily intercepted. So for instance, if you, uh, if you were sending your credit card information and you're using your laptop, it might be possible someone could intercept that. And if it wasn't encrypted, someone might be able to basically steal your credit card information. But then, uh, so, that's, so there's that, and then, uh, but the ways to encrypt it are varied. There's multiple algorithms and different forms of encryption that are used today. So this will tie back into ultra-low power encryption. Just give me a couple minutes. <laughs> so encryption, there's several different encryption types that, uh, that, are, that can tie into ultra-low power encryption. There's, uh, there's private key encryption, also known as symmetric, uh, symmetric ciphers, for instance. And that is where the, uh, the process used to encrypt is the same as the process used to decrypt the information. So encrypt and decrypt. What encrypt means is that's the uh, that's the process of making the information unreadable, and decrypt is the is the making the uh, is making that information readable once again. So that's so now that we know what private key uh, ciphers is, private key encryption is. There's also public key encryption. Public key encryption instead is actually it has um, the process to decrypt is different than the process to encrypt. And so this means that generally it's a little more complicated. It uses maybe slightly more, uh, yet yeah, more complex algorithms. It might have, uh, and it also has to send over part of the information it used to encrypt along with the uh, the encrypted information itself. Uh, as Michael touched on, there was also hashing, and hashing makes uh, basically the information or data. It makes it so that um, it, it it makes it into a fixed size and that uh, it generally encrypted as well. And then that's used to check against the, the, in, the encrypted information that's sent along with it, often used for authentication. So those are, three, those are the three main ways that, in, uh, that encryption is used in this wireless age. Now then, there's different, uh, there's different processes for each of these encryption, uh, I guess, each of the different encryption processes themselves. So for instance, in this private key encryption, there's often a lot of substitution and um, it may, many, many processes that are easily reversed if you are in the authenticated group. So for instance, um, there's S boxes, also known as substitution boxes. What these boxes do is that they exchange data. So let's say that um, we have, a, like there's a certain number there. It might use a lookup table. It might look up this data. Like, for instance, maybe it's uh, the value 17. It will look it up, and maybe the lookup table links to maybe 23, and then it will base it will swap that data with uh, with 23. So, uh, so that's just one example of how these X boxes work. They can also work with, for instance, like a function <laughs> or uh, or some other algorithm. And then uh, besides that, there's also shifts in the data that can happen where you add values to the data. You can rotate it, you can add it, you can move it about. So that it's, overall, it can be very, uh, it's very jumbled, very mixed up. And it makes it very hard for, so for an outside party in order to, uh, to decrypt this. Now, I'm, I'm going to go and look a little bit at these ultra-low power devices, which is the heart of my uh, presentation here today. Ultra low power devices are devices that, as the title implies, are ultra low powered. They, they don't use that much energy because uh, generally they're very, very small, and that has there, there's multiple constraints with that. They have very they have a very low memory capacity. They have very low uh, energy that they can use, and then oftentimes these devices are often sending out streams of information almost constantly. So they also have to be very fast. 
So two examples of these devices are WSNs, or wireless sensor networks. And what these do is it has a, it's a network made up of many nodes. And these nodes have a sensor with them, and then also a transmitter. The sensor senses various information in the environment, like maybe it's a light sensor, it senses movement, maybe it senses pressure or stress. So, and then with that information, it's then sent over with this transmitter, often going on several hops between the nodes before eventually reaching maybe like a, a hub computer or center. RFIDs are, or radio frequency identifiers, are, uh, you, you'll, you'll actually have probably seen them before. So you're in the library and you've checked out a couple of books and you're about to go leave the library and as you're walking out, the, the little alarm starts beeping, and then you, you, you wonder, and then you gotta go back up to the, ch to the checkout desk, you gotta show them the, the little receipt that you have, and then they gotta, they gotta hit, they gotta, they might have to demagnetize it, for instance, or if it's an R, or a radio frequency identifier, they might actually, uh, well, what, the, uh, what that radio frequency identifier would do, it, it's an, actually an RFID system. There's that. It's sending out different frequencies for, depending on, like, for instance, what variable might be there, if it's checked out or not. And then, that's just one example, because these RFIDs, there's countless varieties of them. And there's probably many more that are yet to, uh, that are yet to exist. So, and then uh, another example for the WSNs, it could be, as I said, it could maybe, like, monitor pressure. So, so an important example of that would be monitoring stress on a bridge. Like when cars go over it, you might want to see how it, uh, how it reacts. If it bends or if, it maybe, uh, if one part has more stress on it. So then these wireless sensor networks, they'd, be, they'd all be attached to it. And then they'd be sending out this information saying like, oh, so much stress is here, so much stress is there. And these different capabilities of these ultra low power devices lead, can ha have a lot of implications. It can have a, it allows there to be a lot of malicious action that can be take, that can take place. For instance, let's say that I have an unencrypted signal going between these nodes and there's no authentication either on this bridge that I have. Now let's say that, uh, for instance, Anon decides that uh, he's going to go and he's going to spoof some of this information. He's going to give the incorrect information out there. So then we might be hearing that, oh, there's tons of stress in this corner of the bridge, when in fact, that's not right. It's just something that he made up. Or, in cases where, like, for instance, wireless sensor networks, it might occasionally have to update. It might be sent commands, like, to shock a heart, for instance. It's, uh, there's going to be commands like that. And then, so, the, what, what, uh, so it, so if these commands are spoofed, it can have devastating consequences. Uh, oftentimes there might be private information sent, like people's health information. They might not want that to be open. So all of these are powerful reasons for why this information needs to be encrypted and private, or possibly authenticated. So let's go look at the processes that I outlined about the, uh, the other, the regular encryption systems. And some of these processes, for instance, the S-boxes can be implemented in different ways. For instance, S-boxes can actually be implemented algebraically instead of as lookup tables. That actually eliminates a step because lookup tables first have to look up the data, then switch it, uh, switch the data. And the, what that causes, so basically you can shorten different steps. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's helpful if you use polynomials instead of integers because polynomials have less um, problems than integers do because integers are more likely to have to, you might, you might have to carry over values when you're using the encryption process and that can actually cause, can have uh, significant energy usage throughout it. And then there's certain trade-offs that have to happen. For instance, uh, there's, because there's memory, speed, uh, there, so there's memory, speed, and energy that you all have to be, take, keep track of and make sure that you don't use up any of one of them. So if you're maybe leaning too high on the memory that you're using, you could increase parallelization. That means that you run multiple processes at the same time so that there's no process that's ahead of another. Because if there's a process that's ahead of it, like for instance, and when you're hashing, you might have hashed a portion of it and then you have to keep that portion in memory. But if you're able to keep, uh, have parallelization, you can keep these processes at the same time, eliminating the need to hold too much information in memory or on too, uh, it, the way that it works out is that it also can spe uh, speed things up by having multiple processes at the same time. 
Pre-computation is another way of, uh, of basically de of, uh, decreasing um, the amount of time that it takes. For instance, let's say that, um, that there's a process that you, you're, you can do earlier, but it's not quite time for that. You can compute it beforehand, known in the, then that's the pre-computation. You might have to hold it in memory, however, so that's another thing that you have to know. So, it's, so there's always these constant trade-offs that you have. Now then, there's also, so there's also different versions that you have for these different processes that you have to take into consideration. For the private key encryption, you have to make sure that the keys are all distributed beforehand, which is important because and those might, keys might have to be distributed securely. And with public key encryption, it generally, it's, it's too complex, it's too powerful for these ultra-low power devices, except in certain cases. Like, for instance, in the beginning, when you want to set up all the keys, when you want to add a new node to a wireless sensor network. So generally, public key encryption is used for maintenance, and private key encryption is used for the sending of, of data, or um, in different cases, if it's going to be private data. And then there's also hashing. Hashing allows you to authenticate the data. Like in that bridge, now, in that bridge example that I gave in the beginning, you don't really, it doesn't really matter if someone gets that data. Like they, they can see that, oh, this bridge has so much stress here at this, at, at so and so. It doesn't matter if they get that because that information is probably going to be published anyway. It truly matters if it's a, uh, if it's maybe like a, a spoofed information, like what Anon was doing. So, <clears throat> because in those cases it needs to be authenticated. There needs to be there's a, a integrity and privacy that you also need to that you need to think of in these different cases. So with hashing, there's different versions of hashing that you can use, and probably the most, uh, the best version of it is known as WH. And what it is, it's a weighted, so that it sends out only a, a, a fairly small hash with the information. It uses polynomials instead of integers, and uh, it's it's all in all, it's very it's very speedy and fast, especially, and that's important because you don't want the, there to be too much time taken up because these. Uh, these processes, are, they're always sending out this information almost constantly. And then, uh, you, so all, and then you want to make sure there's no glitches in the chips as well. You have to make sure that there's no, there's no uh, that, you know, we, we talked earlier, uh, Mr. Levitt sometimes talked about, like, having too many people in the bathroom at the same time. <laughs> and what this is, so but when the data gets in before it's fine, it can be in, and then more data comes in before all of the data is finalized, and that can cause a glitch in the chip, uh, not in the chip, sorry, in the processes that are occurring. So uh, ways to get rid of this are to have these clock systems or delays, but then that might, uh, that might take away how much space that you have. And it's just, there's so many different variables that you need to think of when you're, when you're using all of these different processes. You have to think of it constantly. So right now, there's no real truly optimal configuration for these ultra-low power devices. There's, no, there's nothing that's perfect yet. There definitely needs to be more research done on it because it defines different combinations. And it also needs to be tested in the field as well to see how well these encryptions stand up to different, uh, for instance, hackers and different tests. Because it's no good if these encryptions don't do anything, if, if they can be cracked in seconds or minutes even. So there definitely needs to be more tests there. I also want there to be more testing on maybe like the, the physical weaknesses of these devices because when I searched it, Oftentimes, maybe, for instance, maybe the cost is prohibitive. Maybe they can't always test how it is. Or maybe they assume that it's so small that no one will really find it or break it open. Mm -hmm. So what needs to be done is definitely more research, more testing, and basically, and maybe, um, and maybe experimentation with more of these encryption processes. So although there's definitely still challenges remaining, for ultra low power encryption, I definitely don't think that it's too far off. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, yeah. very good. So um, you said um, devices can be stolen, perhaps, yeah. and, and somebody can break them open. So, so, so for cryptography, what would be terrible if somebody broke open a device? If maybe the keys were stored there or the information was all stored there. Right. And that's one of the problems sometimes with the, the private key encryption occasionally right. because if these keys are stolen, there can be a problem. Okay. Can you think of any 
<laughs> any other, uh, like maybe if they could check out what the algorithms were, or if they were able to use it to uh, to maybe spoof some of these That's packets, to use yeah. it to uh, spoof the information. Okay, thank you. Did you stumble across anything about the RFID chip in passports? In passports, uh, for tracking people, uh, there's uh, there's that tracking. Uh, yeah, there's some. I think there's some ethical uh, decisions with that as well. I did hear some things about like with government tracking and things like that, but I I, ha I didn't read too too much into the uh, the password tracking. There was a comment then, uh, gosh, it's a decade ago now, that the encryption is too hard, nobody will ever crack it. Yeah. I think it was a month later that somebody published a crack of it. It was really interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Oh.